Okay. Um, can we kind of go back to, can you tell us about your time at the University of Massachusetts with Dr. Barkley? Yeah, so Russ was actually a graduate of the program at Bowling Green. He was oh. kind of a legend. So you, <laughs> you have to think, you have to imagine this because you probably can't relate to it, but he of course was going through grad school in a pre-word processing era. Okay, so he's someone who accelerated and got through our entire four-year pre-doctoral study in three years. Uh, and then he also um, did dissertation on ADHD with some of the toughest professors at the university. Mm. Uh, and he had this reputation. So he would um, be given revisions or comments from his committee on his manuscript. He would rewrite the entire thing that night and type it by a manual typewriter, <laughs> have copies and have it to their desk the next day. Wow. And he got his dissertation done like in lightning speed. And then he went off and started, you know, doing research clinical work. And he, uh, he was on the DSM-3, 3R4 committees that helped devise the standards for ADHD uh -huh. um, and, di and the disruptive behavior disorders. Uh -huh. And so Russ was just a remarkable scholar. And I had run into him a few places, but in the 90s, ADHD was kind of for a while there, the fad disorder. Uh -huh. Like before that, it was borderline, then autism after that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it was invalid, but it means everyone was suddenly interested in this topic. Yeah. The book Driven to Distraction came out from the two psychiatrists who had the specialty clinic for people with severe ADHD. Um, this was a hot topic. And in the military, we were getting folks coming and saying, I think I have ADHD, please assess me. This is happening so much, even though by standard guidance in the military, ADHD was a disqualifying condition for the military, if you had to go on similar medication, people were still coming forward and it was happening so much the military needed guidance on it. So I was an Air Force psychologist working at the largest military hospital in Europe, which was an army hospital. The army sent me to the Cape Cod trainings to with Russ Barkley to, uh, to figure out a protocol for their adult ADHD assessments. Wow. And while I was there, Russ talked about this research postdoc he had I, so I applied for it. I also applied for the Air Force to fund it as a as an AFIT, meaning Air Force Institute of Technology Fellowship. If they would have, I would have still been on active duty and owed them time when I was done. Uh -huh. I would have as a military psychologist. They decided not to fund any clinical child. I didn't owe them any more time. So I turned down the major promotion and just went off to the postdoc. <laughs> That's the long and short of that story of why I drew, was drawn to that mm -hmm. and what led me there. But going back to an intense postdoc when you've got seven years of clinical experience, mm. I was already by that point, postdocs were becoming an immediate post-degree kind of thing, mm -hmm. like they are for medicine. Uh -huh. Before that, it was something people often did later in their career. So I was a little bit more experienced than some people do tend, tend to be when they go on postdocs. Yeah. Still, it was I decided I was going to be in a student role. Uh -huh. So I took the pay cut to be a postdoc and I, you know, my wife took a job to help make up for it with teaching mm -hmm. and uh, we, we went through that experience, but it was great. I mean, so to do these protocols, I mean, it was my early experience with uh, doing randomized clinical trial research. Okay. So every session was taped. We had these two protocols we were comparing. One was 18 sessions that involved nine sessions of parent training based on behavioral management theory mm. for parents with a teenager who has ADHD and also a conduct or oppositional defiant disorder. Okay. The other was um, 18, 18 sessions of just problem solving communication training, a behavioral family systems approach. So we had these two different protocols. Each session had to be compliant with the design for the therapy it was taped and there were compliance auditors that reviewed uh, the tapes and they would indicate if we were in compliance or not. So I was always in compliance, but I will tell you, there were never two clients I remember treating exactly the same way. Right. So yes, we did the same things you're supposed to do in the session, yeah. but the way you brought them home, the way you related to them, the way you processed it really was specific to the client. Mm, okay. Maybe more comfortable with what some people call cookbook therapy. Uh -huh where they, they mean that pejoratively, like, okay, you follow the script and it means you treat people like they are all the same when they're not. That's mm. actually a bad use of manualized therapy. 
Mm. Just like a physician learns the steps to do an appendectomy, but if you just had them mechanically perform the same incisions, since people's bodies are slightly different, they'd be miscutting some people, right? Mm -hmm. So so they have to adjust the protocol, but they don't look for the appendix in the shoulder. I mean, so there are some things that are standard and there's some things they have to vary to the person. That's what good evidence-based treatments do. Mm -hmm. So they, you have to know when to do both. Uh, And that was really a great experience. Also, because we were the primary research clinic for ADHD, we had folks come out to consult with us. This is in the pre-Chavez days, but we had a delegation from Venezuela come, a delegation from India, a psychologist from Tel Aviv, from uh, Israel at the clinical child program there. And they would come to find out how we were doing ADHD assessments. Mm -hmm. What we found in India and in Venezuela when public school systems were evolving where everyone had to stay in school, the ADHD problems became more of a thing. Mm. With a few exceptions, the numbers were pretty similar world over. So regardless of whether or not a culture had an ADHD consciousness, when you require people to sit in a classroom and focus all day on work that isn't particularly interesting to 10 year olds, Uh you see in human nature, a continuum spread of the ability to self-regulate and keep yourself on task. Mm -hmm. when the situation doesn't hold your attention, like intelligence, it's a kind of a bell curve shaped thing. Uh That upper three to 5% is where we tend to find the folks with ADHD and so regulation deficits, they just, it's harder for them to do that. Mm. If you're in a culture where if you're not inclined to do well with those kinds of tasks, you just don't stay in school and no one tracks it, no one thinks about it, which was true even here in the U S until the mid 20th century, then ADHD is a sort of hidden disorder, right? Mm. But if you are, if you're in a culture where everyone has to use the skill set that they're particularly challenged at, mm. then the problems become evident. So that's what we were finding as we consulted with countries that were now just enforcing kind of universal schooling expectations is they were finding now suddenly an ADHD problem. Yeah, that's... um. So I wanted to ask you, I, I saw this video and the, this guy, a psychologist was talking about this uh, researcher named, I think it's Panksep, Panksep. Yeah, um, Panksep. yeah. So he found that with like with rats, with young rats, if you prevent them from rough and tumble play, that their prefrontal cortex doesn't mature very well. Yes. And that you can, you can help accommodate that with Ritalin. And I was going to ask about that with children and with ADHD. Yeah, so Pangsep was our psychobioprof. He was on Russ's committee, and oh, okay. just recently know. died, unfortunately. But he his mm. his career interest was on the psychology of emotion. He was not a clinician, but his theory about ADHD is that these are animals, and when you use an animal model mm. or humans, um, that that have underdeveloped their self-regulation abilities. And he thinks that free play is really important Mm. for the development of that. It does seem to be important for the development of certain kinds of social skills. Uh, I've talked specifically about this with Russ since they were, you know, both people that Uh were connected. Dr. Barkley doesn't buy that particular explanation of the ideology of play. He's Mm. not seen the data of play as deficits or certain kinds of socialization deficits as the explanation for the etiology of, of, um, of ADHD, but it's an interesting idea. Yeah. I, I do think though, there might be something to uh, frustration control. I, this is a guess, it's a speculation as it was for God. Mm. Um, why do so many people have trouble holding things back? We certainly engaged in a lot of rough and tumble play when I was young. Yeah. Uh, my, I hear stories about my father's generation and the depression and they, you know, <laughs> They would settle things if they got too too problematic with a fist fight, mm-hmm. but no one like seriously injured each other, right? You know, they but yeah. you know, if, if someone hits you, your temptation is not to con- have a controlled response. Mm-hmm. So it takes some work to learn to restrain those impulses. Mm-hmm. And I do wonder sometimes if our culture so inhibits impulses, acting on impulse, that kids never learn to self-regulate a heated kind of Mm. feeling Mm. i'm not saying go out and have your kids box or do mma in preschool but uh (laughs) but what i'm saying is that's possible that's a speculation i don't think that's the story for adhd though i think Mm. adhd people are probably more vulnerable 
to dysregulation in any kind of context. And so if they don't learn how to socialize their play, mm. they're going to have more problems than other people would, but everyone has under socialized um, development is going to have socialization problems. Yeah, that makes sense. The You talk about the vulnerability of some kids with ADHD. And I also, I was reading about uh, personality styles. Like if, if you think of the ocean model, um, like kids who are high in openness, extroversion and neuroticism, but then low in conscientiousness and agreeableness, and you put them in a the classroom, that's really gonna show, right? Yeah, and so, but could that be ADHD? I think the difference is you can have those styles, uh -huh. but if you can check yourself if you need to, mm -hmm. then you probably don't have ADHD. Okay. So the person with ADHD, regardless of their personality style, has less difficulty restraining themselves. They're more vulnerable mm -hmm. to situational control. I so see. another thing we often heard parents say to us is, you say that this is an attention deficit disorder, but if they're playing their video game, I can have a nuclear bomb go off behind their head and they don't flinch. <laughs> uh -huh. so they don't seem to have any problem focusing when they want to. Well, that's precisely what ADHD is. It's not a, it's not a spotlight problem where you mm. have a problem focusing on something. It's a problem of controlling the spotlight, of you regulating it away from the situation that draws your interest. I see. So all of us would rather play the game than get up to eat something if we're not hungry or go take out the trash. Uh -huh. um, but if we know that we need to do it or people are going to be upset with us and there's going to be problems, we stop ourselves, go do it, then come back, right? Uh -huh. The person with ADHD can't do the disengagement for the less interesting thing. So when they're sitting in class, one of the criteria for ADHD in the DSM is freedom from distraction. Uh -huh. They're easily distracted, right? Uh -huh. It's easy for them to go on rabbit trails because um, like that dog, you know, that goes after squirrels, it's... Uh -huh anything more interesting and they're off on a tangent hmm. and all of us feel like doing that yeah. and so probably more than one or two of us have sat through long boring sermons where we'd rather be thinking about <laughs> anything else but if we feel like god may still want to teach us something through the boring sermon we try to stay focused and put some extra mental effort into thinking about how it might apply hmm. right we do the work uh -huh. um, but it's still hard well that difficulty you've had with a boring class or a sermon um that's the way the ADHD person feels most of the time. Mm. That's an important distinguish. That, that makes sense. That's helpful for the way I, I understand it. Um, I, I also, this, is, this was kind of shocking for me when I first read it, and I, I don't know much about it, but with like a Adderall, I know it's Ill illegal in places like maybe, I think the UK and some places in Asia like Japan um, because of the amphetamines. Um, do you know much about about Adderall or amphetamines and and their the well? There's different stimulants that are used for ADHD, and some are, you know, the ones that are safest uh, are are typically prescribed for this condition. Hmm. But we've been using stimulants to improve self regulation and alertness for a long time. Pilots in World War II were given stimulants on those long flights across the Atlantic. And one of the early myths that you sometimes still hear pediatricians voice is that stimulants will interfere with your ability to be focused unless you have ADHD. That's not the case. Stimulants help unless you get too much, right? It helps everyone stay focused. Um, it helps improve our alertness. But with people with ADHD, they have such a deficit in this area that they need stimulants to self-regulate so they have normal or closer to normal self-regulation abilities. And in fact, that's the only thing that really alters the direct uh, attention itself. Everything else is prosthetic. So you help the child pay more attention by increasing how interesting the class is. You mm -hmm. increase feedback to keep them on task. You're, you have a prosthetic environment that compensates for it. You can get normal range performance if someone's mild to moderate with good behavioral control in the environment. But if you want to see them self-regulate, medication is the only thing that does that. Mm. You can teach someone in neurofeedback and other kinds of training, attention control training techniques to stay focused um, while you're teaching them that. And what the research shows is that then when they go 
ahead into the future, even though they can repeat that focus skill if you ask them to again in a similar sort of training condition, when they go ahead in the future, it's all lost. They know how to do it, but mm -hmm. they just don't do it. So it's not a skill deficit. It is a self-regulation deficit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's come back to um, this idea that stimulant use is somehow drug, drug use. So the illicit use of these kinds of products is a problem all over the place. Mm -hmm. People crushing Adderall and snorting and that sort of thing. But what we find with a truly ADHD population is if you effectively medicate them, the chance of comorbid drug addiction or abuse is reduced. It doesn't increase. Interesting. So some people in the substance abuse field would see people with ADHD that were using medications to self-medicate ineffectively. And they would think, well, we have to get them off all medicines. We can't put them on any kind of stimulant because that would you know, feed the drug addiction. But uh -huh. what the research shows is just the opposite, that effective medication of ADHD uh, reduces the likelihood of substance abuse. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there, wouldn't, there couldn't be individual cases. This yeah. goes back to our discussion earlier. We mm -hmm. have to make different decisions. But as a rule, it doesn't seem to be a gateway for substance abuse in mm. people that have ADHD. Now, can people abuse it? So college students taking Adderall just to do performance enhancement that don't have ADHD. Sure, that happens. But mm. I mean, the fact that some people abuse medications doesn't mean they shouldn't be used for what they're, yeah. what they're designed and better uh, attended for, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And... So if the medication helps you to self-regulate, um, is that something that someone with ADHD will have to take throughout the course of their lifetime or does it seem to? So that's a good question. I think it depends on severity and it depends on demands mm. in the environment. So there are certain situations if someone isn't so doesn't have severe ADHD mm -hmm. where, the, where they may not be particularly taxed in these skills. Mm. Say one year, you have a really, really interesting, fascinating teacher, your classmates all are focused and helping you stay engaged. Mm -hmm. And someone with mild to moderate ADHD seems to do okay without any medication. Then the next year, they have a boring teacher, they have classmates that are a problem, they don't like the subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly now they have ADHD. I often have parents come and say, it must be the teacher. Well, they're right in a way, but the other students are still succeeding okay with this boring teacher. Uh -huh. Okay, but so what's going on with that? Well, it's because they're more vulnerable to the environment. Mm. Uh, if you have someone who's severe, we did see people with severe, moderate to severe ADHD at our research clinic. We saw some people who were in a special uh, educational program at Hollow and Rately, the Driven to Distraction People's program. Mm. Um, when you have more severe ADHD, um, you can do all the right behavioral things and there's still going to be a problem. Mm. So that's, that's just the nature of the disorder, but you can, you do what you can. Hopefully you'll make it at least a little bit less of a problem. Mm. 